So good evening. Are y'all ready to worship? You know the the, the, the the catchphrase nowadays, we're in it to win it. Well, for us, we're going to sing it like we mean it. Get your feet. Let's hear your voice. I am resolved no longer to linger gone by the world delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, great is highest, I will come to thee. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time will be no morning breaks eternal bright and fair the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the road is called up yonder I'll be there when the road is called up yonder when the road is called up yonder it's called up yonder when the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. Now what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That made me white as snow, no other fountain I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His graces out? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless so or they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? It's all some glad morning. When this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shores. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away when I die. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Cause I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Way beyond the blue. So do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me do lord oh do lord do remember me do lord oh do lord oh do remember me way beyond the blue on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand let's sing that again on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand Father, that is our claim that we stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, our cornerstone. 
Father, we love you more than we can express. And Father, we thank you for this place and for this people. Father, thank you that you've called us together to be the body of Christ in this place. Father, we thank you for this place that we can come and to love you and to learn from you. And so, Father, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessing of being the Son of God, being with the Son of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 You guys are awesome. All right. Well, it's good to see everybody. Make sure. Yep, I'm on. Can you all hear me? Am I? There we go. I, I was like, make sure I was on, because this past Sunday I was not on, and I was like, hey. So, hey, it's good to see everybody, and uh, before we jump into <laughs> what we're going to do tonight, we have our missionary, uh, our church planner to pray for from the North American Mission Board, this is Josh and Beth Gilt, or Gilt um, and they are with Refuge Church. They asked that we would pray that they would be a gospel light in a very dark area of Jacksonville and pray for many foster and adoptive families in our community that we are privileged to minister to and serve. Uh, and as you can see, uh, they're an adoptive family. Um, and so what's pretty cool about this is we didn't line it up this way. We just happened to see, uh, this just happened to be this week's prayer. And on Sunday, though, we had a fam ministry meeting. And so if you were uh, a part of that, you were in this room, and they uh, talked to you about what FAM uh, it looks like. And when we talk about FAM here at the church, that's Family uh, Advocacy Ministry is what that is. And so what we're doing is we're beginning a ministry here to come alongside foster families, adoptive families, and uh, work with them. And then we're also going to come alongside, uh, most of the time it shows up like a single mother. Um, and, uh, and so we want to work alongside those whenever young ladies find themselves in a place where they do not have any support, but they find themselves with child and uh, they have no place to go. We want them to know that there is a place here and that we want them to be loved and cared for and that Jesus loves them. And uh, uh, those, are, those are things that that oftentimes they feel like they can't find anywhere else. And so if you're interested in that, you can, you can actually ask Jared tonight. Jared's sitting right over here. Uh, he and his wife, Stephanie, they're the ones that's over that whole ministry. And so they can fill you in on what you need to know and do. So just thankful that I get to talk about that and make sure that we pray for that in this church as they are ministering to uh, adoptive families and foster families. So let's take a minute. Let's pray for them. This is a church that we support through our giving uh, to the North American Mission Board. So they're part of our team. This is who they are. We are who they are. We're their family. So let's pray for them. And then, uh, and just a moment, Jared, would you mind lifting them up uh, since it's kind of connected? And told him to be quiet. <laughs> and I turned it off. And so y'all wouldn't hear me fussing at him. No, I always laugh. That group is so good to us, and they take care of us so well. And, uh, and I love it. And one of the things I love is that they have a good time in there and that they can laugh and stuff. But then when we start, I'm always like, 
I got to go tell them they can't laugh so loud. So anyways, we need to pray for the Maltese people. Let's take a moment and pray. And then Dr. Redman, where are, you, are you in here? Would you mind praying for them? All right. All right. So uh, just a couple of things that I want to make you aware of. One, I already told you about Sam. Please keep that in, um, in mind if you're looking for a place to serve and to fit in. And uh, that looks like care communities for people. So like when we know that there's a foster family, it's having a support team that comes alongside them and help them through that, not just with prayer, but uh, even uh, needs that, they, that may arise. A lot of times placements happen in less than two or three hours, just depending on the need and the situation. Uh, so uh, fam ministry. Uh, and then I just wanted to say thank you. A lot of the guys in this room uh, help with our security team at some point or another uh, during the week. And, and I just want to tell you, if you are a part of that group that goes and does that, thank you so much for what you do. And um, it's a huge ministry, and, and there's nothing um, – it, it's not a nothing ministry. You know, a lot of people say, well, what do they do? Well, they, they keep their eyes and ears open. And so uh, there's men and women that serve on that team. And if you, if you have time on Sunday mornings in one of the hours, even if it requires you to stay later than you normally do or come earlier than you normally do, uh, I know that they would enjoy having more people on that team. And uh, Steve Abelos is over that. So if you're looking for a place to, to just, hey, I want to get with a group and get to know some different people, that is a wonderful place to do that. And, uh, and then also you get to, like, shake hands. Like if you get in the children's lobby, you get to see all those kiddos and their families come in. You get to shake hands with them. Tell them how excited you are that they came to church that morning. And listen, that's what makes, that's what makes church a family. That's what, that's what changes the atmosphere, is that whenever we come into contact with people, that they know, man, we're excited you're here. We're thankful that you're here. So if you uh, are looking for that. And then you're going to start hearing a lot about this, and it's going to be said on Sunday mornings too, like, this is a great thing. But if y'all don't know this, so we split our services or changed the service schedule not too long ago to to get more room in Sunday school. So now we have three Sunday school hours and two worship services that are at 9.45 and, or 9.30 and 10.45. Well, the services are still, there's room to grow in both of them. Um, but we're quickly getting to about 80% in the first and we're at about 65% in the second now. So while you may be going, well, they're not full because if you were in the second service before we made the switch, it was like packed. Well, now we're getting to where, because first service was like 25% full. It was very small. Well, now they're both growing like we thought they would, so it was a good move, and we're hoping that it continues to grow. But because of the change, we're seeing a bunch of new families show up, which is great. And we are now packing our children's building to the brim every single Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning. Now, everybody saying amen. amen. Now, I'm going to say the next line, and you need to say Amen. But you're probably not going to want to say, man, listen, we can't sustain growth without new people saying, you know what, I'll commit. And I'll commit to once a month, or I'll commit to twice a month, or I'll be a teacher. Um, and I know that's hard because we all enjoy our Sunday school hour. But listen, whenever we think about how we are going to grow, if it's, hey, I've got a spot for my kid and I don't have to deal with them for a few hours, listen, I get it. everybody gets it. Everybody's a parent is a parent full time. But listen, we have to be the ones that say we will step up. New families coming in, they're trying to just figure out if we're safe or not. And one of the pictures that shows them we're safe is when there's enough adults in a room, whenever there's enough teachers there and the classes can be split because we have enough people that we can split. Because like right now, we sometimes will have up to 30 kids in one room in the third grade room. I mean, I don't know if you've been in those rooms. They're not made for 30 kids. Now, we can do that. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would tell you, husbands, if you say, well, that's not permission for my wife, listen. I have yet to find a dad or a husband that goes in that the kids don't fall in love with, and guess what? 
he falls in love with the kids. So I'm going to tell you two stories. One, Amy and Kirby, um, they used to come to church here. They moved up to the Tyler area. But they took, what, the threes? Was it two? Three-year-olds. They took the three-year-old class, and Kirby was like, I cannot do this. I cannot do this. Three-year-olds. And there was like 15 three-year-olds. I mean, it wasn't like a small group of uh, three-year-olds. 15 three-year-olds is like 30, okay? It doesn't matter. It's only 15. It's like 30. And so they would go in there. Well, by the time they had to leave, when they were moving, I think Charles had a harder time leaving that class. But they would go in, and they would want to see his hands, and they would want to talk to him about what he did this week. And he would sit on the floor, and they would just come around. And, and if, you, if you know Kirby, you know this. He has back problems, and has had back problems for him. But, man, he would get on that floor and let those kids come sit right next to him. And whenever they were talking about that, he just said, listen, they've changed me a lot. And so I was thankful for that testimony. The second thing I want to tell you, um, it just happened uh, just recently uh, in our uh, children's building. So we, we have a, gr- a couple that uh, came, and when he first came here, he came into our men's group. I'm not going to say the name because the, some of the guys will know who it is. Uh, but he came, he walked through our men's Bible study on a Sunday night, and we had never really seen the guy before. He just kind of like walked up, and he was very quiet, and he sat in the very top row, the farthest place he could go from the front. And he sat, and we even had to introduce and say our names. He, like, didn't even want to say his name, and it was, like, so quiet. And uh, over the course of the past two years, they have taken steps, and now he's one of the integral parts of, like, the children's uh, worship hour in the, in the big room over there in the landing. And he's talking to the kids. He's laughing. He's playing with them. Uh, he's able to speak up. And those are the things, like, when you say, well, I, I need to learn, listen, you learn being over there. And as we grow, we're going to have to understand it's going to take all of us committing and even to say, I have Sunday school at 815. Like senior adults, you don't get to retire from church and, and serving the Lord. You get to retire from your job that you provided money with. You don't get to retire from serving the Lord and serving the body of Christ. And so it may be that you have to go to 815 Sunday school, 930 worship, and then go in the nursery and hold babies from 1045 to 1145. Well, that's a third hour at the church. Okay. We're designing our church literally to have, if all you can get, because we live in a shift world. We live in a place where we have a lot of moving pieces, and we know that. So we're trying to strategically be the best that we can, that on Sunday morning a family can come and they can worship, they can serve, and they can be fed in a Bible study all in one morning because we know with shift work, that may be the only time that a dad can come. It may be the only time uh, they didn't come on a Wednesday night. So we're always going to have a teaching time on Wednesday night. There's always going to be things like that because we know how the rotation of life happens around here. But what that does mean is that we're asking you all as well to say, hey, you know what, from 8 in the morning on Sunday till noon, Man, if, if we need to do something because it furthers the family, if it's better for the family, if it edifies the family, if it reaches people for Christ, that we're all in. And we will do what is needed. And so if you have that ability, I would encourage you, like, and when I say we're getting overran, we are literally in the children's building. Like, it, they need help every single week. And uh, we've got to figure out how to fix that because the building of homes is not slowing down. And I have yet to meet, I've, I've only met one or two couples that have come in and said, well, we came and visited and this isn't going to be our church home. Most people who, who find out we're here, that's the first thing we got to overcome. They're always like, we didn't even know y'all were up here. And I'm like, yep, we've been here for a long time, but they don't know we're here. But when they come in, they go, man, we, we feel so at home here, which means they stay, which is fantastic because we have the opportunity to disciple them. They have the opportunity to help us be discipled and disciple us. And so we need to remember that. So just know we're, we're going to be talking about this a lot because we need it. We have to have more people uh, helping, especially with children. And so you're off hour on Sundays, do it. If you go, you know what, I can teach. I've just been putting it off because <sighs> I've just been putting it off because it's been nice to take a break. Listen, Nathan Lort, one of my better friends, he says this all the time. Uh, stop worrying about what you get to do when you retire and stop worrying about what you need to do before you expire. And I believe that statement 100%. I tell Rhonda all the time, even if one day I can't fulfill the ministry obligations here because I get too weak to do it, 
We will move somewhere where there's a small church that just needs somebody that can pastor their church because I cannot stop doing what I do because it has nothing to do with my paycheck. And I hope all of us feel that way when it comes to how we do things for the Lord, that it's not about, man, what do I get out of it? Man, this is what the Lord's doing, and I want to be a part of what the Lord's work is. And, um, and so not a guilt trip, just saying as we grow, and I don't know if you've been watching, but there's a lot of sticks going up in the air over here at Eagle Drive and, and City Hall. I mean, it's insane watching that neighborhood come up. And that's 5,000 homes there, 14,000 in between Dayton and Mont Bellevue on 146 with the lagoon. My girls are already asking how much it's going to be to get into that thing. So they're, they're already planning for that. But that doesn't include any other developments that's around. I mean, just go down 1409, and before you get to Perry right there, they're, or right off of Perry, they're building all that stuff on the park, on that parkway. Is it Gill Parkway? Is that what they call that right there? Gill Parkway, there's homes going all right there. And guess what? We need to tackle those things. We need to be there. We need to, we need to know who they are and how we can pray for them. And they need a church home because I believe the Bible commands us to be in a church home to grow together. So that is, that is my announcements for this week. So, yes. Nope. Would you pray right where you're at? Yeah. All right, tonight's my favorite night uh, because I have to see if I can answer a question. So... Um, tonight is Ask the Pastor a Question Night, um, which I did tell Diana she could ask a question if she had one, even though last week y'all got like an extra like 15-minute lesson because of her question. Um, it was a good question, though. It was, it was good. It, that, oh, that was rough at the end. That, that hurt me. I mean, I was not bad. It was just like, oh, man, she made me cry. <laughs> so, um, so it was all good. Anyways, uh, when I say ask a question, you can text me um, or you can just, we can just ask for questions. I'm going to repeat the question tonight because uh, people, um, they can't hear the questions on the live stream. So they're always like, well, that was a great answer to whatever that was. And so, uh, so anyways, or maybe they thought that was a really bad answer for whatever that was. Um, but we'll repeat the question. Uh, but we've been talking about spiritual gifts and, and how that looks on Sunday morning. So I know that always raises a lot of questions about that. And I want to make sure uh, we're, we're just scheduled to talk about spiritual gifts on Wednesday nights for the next few weeks as we walk through these chapters in 1 Corinthians on Sunday morning. So I'm opening it up, and I will see what I can do with it. Anybody have any questions? Nobody has a question. It's going to be a long evening. And Wes, you better not just ask one that you're like, You can. You can text them to me and I'll read them, or you can just say, here's my question. You don't, you don't have to text it. Yes, sir, Dr. Revan. Mm. Mm. Well, and, and honestly, those types of questions, the correct answer to that is I cannot answer that. Um, what we can answer, though, is that we know that God is eternally good, his purposes are eternally good, that his will will be fulfilled, and that he will have it serve his purposes no matter what it is. And so in not destroying Satan, there is something that is in God's plan that will bring more people to his side, that will bring him glory, that will show that he is God because of that. Now, I can't answer why or how, but what I do know is if I believe God is good and his purposes are good and he doesn't make any wrong decisions. See, here's the thing. This is where you can't get to where like, God, why do you allow bad things to happen? Well, bad things happen on the earth uh, because we're in a fallen world. There's things that happen because of uh, sin, decay, disease, all those things. And so that's the answer to a lot of those things. 
Why do good, bad things happen to good people? Well, the answer to that is, is bad things happen to bad people. The Bible tells us that no one is what? Good. So even whenever somebody who's living a life for Christ, whenever something bad happens on earth, it is a repercussion of the sinfulness in our world. And even whenever we're redeemed and God has shown us that we're cleansed through Christ, we're forgiven in Christ and we're a new creation, the world is, is that bad things happen to bad people all the time. And, and there's not really good people. There's only been one who was good. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? Because he wanted them to define why they said he was good when they said good teacher. And he said there's only one that is good. And he was the only good person. And so we have to remember there's questions like that that kids, I mean, Tammy, Rhonda gets a pass because she's like, well, your dad's a pastor. But she's actually, she actually answers quite a bit of them. But there's a lot of times she's like, hey, you get to answer this one. High five. And I'm like, no, that's, not, that's no fun. Um, but there's a lot of questions like that that we cannot go back into eternity past. And his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. At the end of the day, it comes down to do you have faith that God is good or do you not have faith that God is good? And if you do, you have to stand on that fact and whatever the reason is that Satan was not destroyed, it will serve his eternal purposes and bring him glory in some way that we can't even understand. So that is that. So you can say, I don't know, and I answered better than the pastor. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> we don't care. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. You had a drug problem. You were a drug every time it was open, right? Yeah. <laughs> She's like, no, I didn't have no drug problem. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, ma'am. Well, and so, yes, ma'am. Well, and at the end of the day, we all have to understand that we believe what's in the Bible by faith. That's right, but that's what I'm saying. That's. Yeah, so that, I know, and I get what he's saying. I, I get what you're saying about him. So when we have people that are skeptics, one, we got to remember that, that arrogance and pride are sin. Arrogance and pride are sin. Don't make the person any worse than anybody else. It just means they're a normal lost person. That they, they feel like they have a tangible, they have to have a tangible answer or some kind of logical answer for everything. However, that's not true in any situation. Because I would challenge him, like if I was sitting in a room with him, he said, well, you can't prove to me that Paul wrote this. Okay, well, I can't prove to you the chef in the kitchen didn't poison you either. And if you just pick up the bite and eat it, you are trusting something just because. And so we drive over, I mean, I know this is a, a worse description now because the Baltimore accident was hit by a boat, but we don't test bridges before we drive over them. No one checked their chair to make sure that it had, uh, you know, all the stuff they needed. You, when you, When you get in your car, you don't go, well, I had this car. I had a car that I prayed over every morning to hope it would start. But most people get in their car, and you just you, you don't even think twice. You just turn the key because you have faith that it's going to start. Well, every skeptic, and, and it's not just a skeptic, every lost person walks that same road. And they can say whatever they want about, well, I don't put my faith in anything I can't prove. That's a false statement. They can't, they can't rely on that because you can never say that. You can't sit in a chair, you can't drive over a bridge, you can't eat food that you didn't see prepared, you can't do any of that. 
So um, when it comes to how do I witness to the person, that's a completely different uh, that's a completely different discussion. If we're trying to get someone to understand that they logically have an illogical argument, that's apologetics, and that's a whole framework in itself. That's what I just did. That's an apologetic argument that I'm trying to get them to logically see that they're irrational in what they're doing. Um, but how you witness to somebody is exactly what Paul says that we should do when somebody is lost, and especially uh, in a marriage, the Bible talks about when there's someone who's saved and when someone's not saved, that they're married. It says that we become like Christ and we serve them as Christ served us, and we love them through everything. And so even in the midst of uh, whatever it may be, an anger attitude, or we just serve, um, if he doesn't ever get up out of the chair and you feel like you're doing everything, the call of Christ is to continue to do everything and then plus some to show him how Christ loved you and you want to love him like Christ loved you. And, and the Bible says that's the way that you win an unbelieving spouse to the Lord is by becoming a servant unto them like Jesus was a servant to you. It's not about arguing with them. It's not about having those things because at the end of the day, the hardness of his heart isn't going to come. It's not going to turn to flesh because of an argument that is proven to him that he can accept. At the end of the day, the only thing that can turn him is your greatest influencer, which we talked about this Sunday in church, that our greatest influencer is the love of Jesus Christ. And it's just love, 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 love. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people. Good people die and go to hell all the time. And that's. Well, it's not according to you. And that's where that's where it's not according to me. It's according to the word of God. And, and that's what you just got to lean on. Listen, I don't get to judge anybody. I don't get to judge anybody, but what I can say is that if you've never done what the Bible says, then I'm worried that you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And by the way you live your life or the way that you don't, that you even say, I don't trust in Christ. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's the wager. That's a that's an old argument. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing. It, but at the end of the day, um, someone getting saved just just for if it's real isn't salvation. And that's what we've got to that's what we got to do. However, that's a good way to break a mind open to say, have you thought through this? Um, the 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 easiest opening to every gospel conversation. It doesn't matter is. You say you're good. What makes you good? What makes you good? And then people are going to list all their good things. And people do good things. But then if you say, okay, tell me the things you've done wrong. And are you willing to tell me things that you don't even tell other people you do that you know is wrong? Can you list those? Well, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you even have more good than bad that you can remember. The one bad ruins the whole loaf. That's what the yeast is. A little yeast leavens the whole loaf. And so it's not about how much bad it is. It's that one sin completely defiles. The problem is, is that we do not even see all of our own sin. We, we can't keep tally marks on our own sin because we don't even understand the depth of our sin. So... But yep, okay, I think I had, okay, let's go. Um, okay. Been through a lot in my life. I'm doing my best to trust God in order to move on from them. The guilt from those things and situations is still there. How do I deal with that in the way that still glorifies God? Okay, 
So no matter what the situation is in your life, um, this is one of those things that we always think we're the Lone Ranger in, in these things. However, if everybody's life was actually played in a movie in here and we all had like Life of Pi moments where everybody's life got thrown up on the screen, you would be shocked, astonished, sad, and happy when you watched everybody's movie. Because everybody's life has had ups and downs. Everybody's life is filled with glorifying God in moments and breaking God's heart, heart in moments. There's all these things that we have in our life. And so first, one of the things that you have to work past is that God came to save you because of the things that you hold on to. And one of the things that I, I've always loved was we, we show these moments in movies where if you've watched The Last Mission Impossible, this is the last one I can remember, but there's always this moment where the hero, I mean, it's in Emperor's New Groove all the way to a Mission Impossible, where the hero is like, listen, you're just going to have to trust me and let go to come to me. Emperor's New Groove, it's when they're in between the crevice, and he says, you just have to trust me. In Mission Impossible, uh, the newest one, part one, it's whenever the piano's about to fall, and he says, you're just going to have to trust me and jump. And he tells her, and she does. Until you truly just jump into Jesus' arms, you're still holding on to things in the past. And you can't move forward if you're holding on to things in the past. Okay, now, two things about that. Just because you let go of things in the past doesn't mean that you forget everything that's happened in the past. That's a false teaching. The Bible never says that you will forget everything that's bad that's happened in your life or that you did wrong or that happened to you. That's not. How you walk in forgiveness towards someone that hurt you or how you walk in a humble way if you have been someone that has hurt somebody else is a display that God is still teaching you from your past sin or from a sin committed against you to become more like Christ-like. Listen, if you've been offended, you will never be as offended as Jesus was. Yet he still chose to forgive and walk forward. But when Peter approached him after Jesus rose from the dead, did Jesus go, well, I don't even remember what you did. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus helped restore, even though he had to rub the pain a little bit in Peter's life. He still chose to say, listen, do you love me? And when he asked him three times, Peter knew why. What we also forget is in that moment, he started a charcoal fire. There's only two places a charcoal fire is talked about in all of the New Testament. One is whenever he makes breakfast for the disciples. It says that Jesus made a charcoal fire. One instance. You know where the other one was? It's where Peter was standing when he denied Jesus the third time. So even the smell of the fire got his attention. And in that moment, Peter had to make a decision. Well, I can't believe you're going to throw this back in my face. Or he could say, no, I was wrong. And I know I hurt you. Jesus could have been, I don't know you anymore. But instead he chose, hey, I forgive you and you're still useful. And so whenever I read uh, things like this where it's so hard to walk forward from, here's the thing. One, God will use what has happened in your past to bring you closer to him and make you more like him. He's not going to let that go to waste. He always makes beauty from ashes. And when you think you're alone, you're not. You're not. When you think, well, I'm the only one that's walked through whatever. No one else's wife did this. Nobody else's husband did this. Nobody else's kids did this. Nobody else's parents did this. Nobody else suffered this at their job. Nobody else. Listen, I don't know. I would yell it from the rooftop. Just because there's an infidelity doesn't mean there has to be a divorce. Just because somebody hurt you doesn't mean that you have to hurt them. Just because um, parents divorce doesn't mean that you're going to get divorced. Just because your kid went astray doesn't mean that you were the worst parent. Just because your kid looks at you and tells you something that you're like, why on earth would you say that and I never taught you to say that? Does it mean you taught them that? They have a sinful nature. They have all those things. So in this stuff, like, listen, you are not alone. Do not think, well, I have to hide these things. The worst thing you can do 
is hide things when you're struggling and not get brothers and sisters to come alongside you and say, listen, I know that hurts. I can't understand what you're going through. But you know what? Jesus was spit upon. Jesus was betrayed. People were, they, they cheated on him, not, it, not in what we would say in a marriage, but they were his closest, and they completely turned their back on him. Uh, he was beaten. He, he watched people die that didn't need to die. You know, like we talk about, well, he raised Lazarus from the dead. He didn't experience people dying because he knew he was going to come back. Listen, Jesus watched people die all the time just like we do. Joseph isn't mentioned after the temple issue where Jesus gets left behind. We never hear of Joseph again. And that's most likely that he passed away because the next thing that we read about Mary is that she's living with the children and that they're taking care of their mother. And at the cross, he says, John, here's your son. I mean, here, uh, John, here's your mother, and mother, here's your son. So that means there wasn't a man in her life to care for her. Jesus was fully acquainted. But when the Bible says he is acquainted with our grief, he knows our sorrow, and he is a man of sorrows. It means that while you're walking through things, he knows what you're walking through, and he knows the pain this world has. The only difference between you and him is he died for your sin, and you're the one that caused your sin. But he bore the wrath of God so you wouldn't have to, and he knows what it's like to feel the wrath of God for sin. So don't walk it alone. Okay. Yep. Um. Mm -hmm. So the roadmap in our church, and um, just so y'all know, we're actually working through actual roadmaps coming in the fall. Like our staff is already having to recite some things and memorize some things, and we're working on different ways that we call discipleship paths. We're working on that stuff that we're going to start building in. Uh, but in that, the number one way is to first find a Sunday school class, a small group. That's what we call a small group at our church. And you get in and you plug in. And you don't just be the people that sit in the back and don't say anything. You start living life. If your kid's having a hard time with a test and they're scared, voice that. If your marriage is struggling, voice that. Those are things that if we, it, the Bible tells us where truth is, there's freedom. The Bible also says if we confess our sins one to another, we find forgiveness. And we can be restored. The problem is we all hide in the background. And we're scared of things because, well, what if they think this? Listen. I said, if they watched a movie of West High Oaks Life, y'all would be so much disappointed in me. But no one else can say anything different. No one is better than anybody else in the room. And that's where we, that's where we get on. So Sunday school is the first place. Uh, we also have a counseling center here. And, and also, if it's family issues, like if it's deep marital issues, deep family issues, listen, counseling is not for weak people. Counseling is for people, and it's for messy people. And guess who's messy in this room? Every single person. And so finding a good Bible-believing, solid, Christ-centered counselor that you can talk with, that doesn't mean that your marriage is falling apart. It actually means that you're willing to put your marriage out there to save. Now, I just... Honestly, if somebody came to my office and said, listen, we can't afford it or we don't know if it's worth it, listen, I'll pay for your counseling. And if the church can't afford to do it, I will help pay, and I know there will be other people in this church that believe in your marriage because guess what? Satan hates your marriage. He hates your kids. He hates your marriage. He hates that you're sitting here tonight. He hates all of that. And so he wants to drive a wedge in all of those things. And so first pass at Sunday school, you can come to the pastor, talk to them. Um, and in Sunday school, that doesn't mean you have to stand up and like air your dirty laundry because that's what everybody's always like, what is that? But in your Sunday school class, it will, it will not take very long for you to go, hey, I can trust these two or three people and they can surround me. And when you find those two or three people, you let them surround you. And then I would encourage you to get with one of the pastors and say, hey, this is an accountability group that I set up for myself. Not because we need to give insight into that, but because then we can say, okay, how is this working? What's going on? And we can begin to help mold the discipleship processes for you. Those are things that we want to see in our church. And we see them all the time. They're just more organic than a structure. 
but because of our growth, we're having to think through how do we structure these things in a discipleship path where we can, where we have methods and pathways that people can find readily when we need them. So good question, bro. Good question. If you're not plugged into a small group, that's where the life of the church is as far as like community. And when everything else fails, the people that surround you is who you depend on. I just visited a lady this week. Many of y'all know Mr. Gann lost his son-in-law in a tragic accident. Somebody, uh, his son-in-law was riding a bike and uh, was a, is a cyclist, was riding his bike and a car hit him and killed his son-in-law. And visiting with his wife, she said, I've been coming for the past few weeks just visiting and, and I've gotten so far away from church, but I know now I need a church more than anything because I need that family. Listen, and I told her, I said, we're not going to push you away just because you haven't been coming. We want to wrap our arms around you. But how she felt in that moment, that she felt like I'm alone, listen, no, we don't want anybody feeling like they're alone at all. Okay, move, see if I can answer another one. Um, what is holiness? I've always heard being set apart and more like Christ, but those are very vague, ans vague answers. Okay, what is holiness? Okay, so holiness literally means, the actual word means set apart. That's what the word actually means. And so when we say holiness, what that looks like, it means that you are set for a different way of life. And holiness is defined in the Bible. Holiness is the pursuit of God above all else. The, the Holiness is the love of God above all else. And holiness is obedience of God above all else. So it's love, obedience, and pursuit. You put those together, and that's, it sets you apart from everything else. I know that's a quick answer, but that's really all it is. And um, it's not a special gifting. Anybody in this room uh, can pursue God, anybody can love God, and anybody can obey God. That's right. It's a choice every single moment. It's, I mean, the next decision that comes up, am I going to pursue God, love God, and obey God in this? That's holiness. And you just keep walking in it. The longer you walk in it, those choices become second nature to you. So, point it. Okay. Um, what's a good resource for studying the Bible, of how the Bible came together, uh, for what was included and what was not included? Those are always big questions. Um, we're In one of our discipleship pathways that we're talking about, we're talking about a new believers class. And, uh, and so we're talking through that, and it's going to introduce just the Bible and how its composition. But in that, we're also thinking about doing a class. And when we say discipleship pathways, we're talking about like on Sunday nights, there being a true university model. Like, hey, if, you want, if you're a new believer, here's 101, here's 201, here's 301, here's 401, and literally walk a new believer in that. If you want to be a Bible teacher, like if you want to study so you can become a better Bible teacher or you want to take up Bible teaching, Here's what we're going to do. Here's 101. So you need to understand why the Bible is written, how it was written, and all those things. 201, all those things. So, so we've been working through some of this. Um, but a good resource for that, um, I would say Dr. Elmer Towns. Uh, he has a book on Christian doctrine. Uh, the, it's, it's actually just called Systematic Theology. Um, Dr. Elmer Towns would be a good one. Um, Erickson is a good one, uh, which his is also – these are just uh, – uh, uh, theology books. They're not, they're not easy reads. They're academic theology books. Uh, but what I can tell you about the composition of the Bible, and you can go back and check me on this. Um, so whenever the apostles started to pass away, there were their writings, and the church knew it was their writings. Now, spiritual gifts are a big part of that. Um, and you have to do a big study on spiritual gifts to understand the difference between a sign gift and the gifts that were ongoing, why sign gifts were there. Uh, but as the apostles began to pass away, people were writing false books. In fact, some of them started coming around uh, after all the apostles died, and they were, they were actually, like, given the name of somebody that really wasn't. So, like, the Gospel of Thomas, which was written, like, at 200, it, it, not even close to when Thomas was around. Well, they would find conflict in those, and the church, the early church, like uh, Josephus and, and Justin, all these people that lived within 100 years of Jesus, they began to see, they began to see hey, this isn't it. And Christians, the people who had accepted and learned from Jesus or learned from the apostles, would go, this is not true. This is not real. So before the Council of Nicaea, which is where everybody usually says, this is where the Bible got put together. Before they even got there, 100 years before they ever got there, Christians had already said, those are false books, and this is the ones that, these are the apostles' books, and this is it. And so there was already a canon, basically, 
But when it got to the Council of Nicaea, there were so many false teachings. They said, we need to just for once and for all say, this is what the church has accepted, that the earliest church fathers, the earliest Christians said, these are the teachings of the apostles. These are not. And they separated them. And they said, this is the New Testament. And so that's how we got the New Testament. So the criteria was, were they written by an apostle or were they a scribe of that apostle? So if you go through, or somebody that was, well, I say apostle, that's somebody who saw and learned from Jesus. So even James and Jude, they're half-brothers of Jesus. They learned from Jesus. They were taught by Jesus. They actually saw him resurrected because the Bible says he had first appeared to the women, then he appeared to Peter, and then to James, and then the other disciples. So the other, his half-brothers got to see him alive after that. And so that's, the apostles had to be the writers. Uh, the other thing was is that they had to be congruent. They couldn't be like some far-fetched idea. Like the Gospel of Thomas was easy to throw out because it has all this stuff in it that doesn't line up with any of the other teachings. So it was very easy. One, Thomas had already been dead. And two, it didn't, it didn't work with the rest of the Bible. And so that's how the early church made their decision. So uh, when people say, well, they just decide what was in or out, that's false. That's false. The apostles were the ones that wrote what they had learned from the Lord or people transcribed for them. So like whenever you have Luke, he probably learned from Jesus some as well, but he was Paul's scribe. So it's Paul's, t- I mean, Peter's uh, scribe. So it's he- Peter's teaching, Luke is writing. And he's just giving his accounts of what everything was. So, um, but I would send you to a systematic theology book. That's where I'd send you to. Um, let's see. I'm trying to run through these. Cain and Abel, there seemed to be all kinds of other people on the earth at that time. Why the people, Mark? Where did they come from? Okay, now. Ooh. Okay, what you have to remember is how many dogs got on the ark? Do you believe just two? No. Yeah, dogs got on the ark to hear. <laughs> okay, so why not two chihuahuas? Not why not two Dalmatians? Why not? Why not? Okay, because that is not evolution. That is called adaptation and genetic coding. The first dog. The, God did not have to create. Okay, this is how creative our God is. <laughs> he doesn't have to create a chihuahua in a Dalmatian, what he did is he created dogs. And in its earliest stages, the dog had every bit of DNA coding that as it began to branch out, it would adapt to environment in some ways that it would adapt, but as that DNA began to break down and go further away from each other, specific things started to show up in people. I mean in dogs. And then you have all that. So, so say, but it's the, say, the reason I asked that question, you asked, well, they just asked about people, why are you saying that? Because Adam and Eve, it's the same thing. Whenever we think about, well, you're not supposed to marry your brother, your sister, all those things. Okay, listen. You have to understand that we don't know exactly how all of it worked, but we do understand that Adam and Eve probably had hundreds of kids. They lived for 900 years that we know of. That's after the fall. We don't know how long they were in the garden. I know if it was me, it would have taken like three weeks to fall. Like I would have gotten bored in three weeks and it would have been, it would have been over. They could have been in the garden for 300 years, 400 years, 1,000, we don't know. And whenever everything changed for people, now I tend to think that it was pretty quick because it doesn't talk about people being expelled from the garden. It just talks about that they were expelled and that was it, and then they populated the earth. So I choose to think it was pretty early, but then they began to have kids. And if you think that it's every 15 to 20 years, a child, a generation can start having kids. By the time somebody's 45, they could have multiple grandkids. Not even, I mean, they could almost be a grandparent at 54. I mean, a great-grandparent at 54. So when you start thinking about great-grandparent at 50, great-great-great-great-great-grandparent at 100, when you multiply that out by 900 to 950 or 1,000 years at a time, you're talking about one person being able to meet like 18 to 20 generations. Like if you ever take Adam's lifespan and you lay it out and you see where Noah was born, there's very little time between Adam and Noah because Adam lived so long. And so you have to remember that that DNA, though, was crammed. Every DNA that's sitting in this room, that we have no relation to each other, most of it. 
But if you take our DNA, and independent secular studies have been done that find that DNA all go back to four people. It has an original two, a population explosion, and then it comes down to another two. Every person in this room, according to secular studies, came from four people. The first, and then after an explosion, the second couple. So who are those two couples? Adam and Eve and Noah and his wife. And we have secular studies that show DNA, so that means that every bit of DNA that makes every person on this earth, from the darkest skin to the lightest skin, from the bluest eyes to the brownest eyes, from the blondest hair to the darkest hair, all that DNA was packed into Adam and Eve. So the thought that we have of uh, genetic problems, if, if there's too close of a relation in those things, it's way different. And I don't understand all of that stuff, and there's moral and ethical things that we live in today, and there's actually a moment in the Bible that it talks about that, that these are things that have now become an abomination, and the reason that they say is because it wasn't before that. And so there's things that we have to realize. We, we don't get all the answers, but we do know that there are people there for Mary, and it most likely was a sister or a cousin or something of that line just as they spread out on the earth. Now, we all go, Bleh. I can't give you a better explanation. I can just tell you that's how it works. So, all right. We got to get to prayer time in just a moment because I don't want to leave Chris hanging, but I want to try to answer as many questions as I can. Um, if you could ask Jesus to change one problem in the world today, which problem would you pick? The lostness of man, that, that would be it. I mean, if I because I want everybody to go to heaven, um, not because they just get to go to a place. I want them to know Jesus. That's, that's the problem to pick. Uh, but the problem I see in the world today that it, selfishly I would pick is that he would just come back. It would just be done. And it, that he would make everything right. So that would be it. Uh, I'm not going to solve world hunger or world peace or anything like that. That, that just satisfies here. Um, I, w I want something that's eternal. Somebody can die of hunger and go to heaven. Somebody can be fat and go to hell. I, and, and I'm more interested in where their soul is going to be for the eternity than where their body is for the next 20 years that they're alive. Um, sorry if that's direct and clean cut, but that's just who I am. Um, I'm ashamed that I love Jesus and yet have many fears, including death. Uh, so, okay, you're ashamed that you, while you love Jesus, you have fears, including death. Um, I pray you're still a coward. Uh, does that change with age and maturity? Listen, I've stood at the side of a bed with people who are dying that are scared that have known Jesus their whole life. Uh, the thing about death is it's the, great, it's the great equalizer. It's the common denominator. No one in this room has ever faced death before, like literally like at the doorstep um, and, and knows what it's like to die. Some people have gotten really close. I mean, we just were celebrating Jared, was it three years now? Three years. I remember talking to Jared at one point, three years, at, well, a few days ago, three years ago, that I thought I was, that was the last time I was going to hear his voice. Um, some of y'all know Rick that used to come, uh, that served in the youth, and I went in the hospital, and they said, Pastor, we're glad you're here tonight because he won't be here in the morning, and prayed over him, and he walks around. Now they live in Magnolia, and he sends a church over there. So there's people who's been close, but no one has actually ever died. Now, if we got to see Enoch and Elijah and they got taken away, they didn't experience it, Lazarus is one of the few people that we could get to say, hey, they died. And when people say, well, they resuscitated me, I actually died. Listen, you didn't see Jesus and you didn't stand at the judgment. That's the great common denominator. So does that ever change? No, but your confidence in Jesus does. The longer you walk with him, the more confident you become in who he is. Will that fear of death ever leave? Sometimes it won't, sometimes it doesn't. I really, um, I, I don't know if I can fear it because I just don't know when it's going to happen. Um, I tell people all the time I don't like going to doctors because they're like mechanics. If they don't see something wrong, they're going to find something wrong. And, uh, and so I just, I'm always like, I'm not going to go in until I know I need to. And uh, so that means I may, I may fall over tomorrow. <laughs> But at the same, I know Dr. Redmond's like, I'm your doctor. <laughs> but at the end of the day, here's the deal. Here's what I truly believe. The Bible says that my days are numbered and my days have been allotted. And on the day that God has said, I'm going to see him, I can't change that. So I can't fear what's going to happen. And that's when people go, well, that's a dangerous thing to do. Like when people go skydiving, I'm like, hey, live life. Your day's allotted. If it's that your parachute don't open, at least... You had a great time in the fall. The only thing you got to worry about is hitting the ground. It's not that big a deal, and that's done. 
I mean, seriously, like if you, if you really think that there's not a whole lot that we can do about it. So but if we live in fear, then we hold ourselves back. Um, and so the more you trust in Jesus, the more you lean on, the more that's going to change in your life. Um, and I think that's really it. But is it, is it okay to have fears about death? Absolutely. I mean, I ask God, <laughs> I think Rhonda knows this, but like every night when I go to bed, I thank him for a great day and that I had a chance to serve him. And one of my last thoughts that I try to, uh, like this past few nights, I've been listening to a spiritual gift teaching because chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, if you don't know this, it's terrible, okay? It's terrible, but we're, we're going through it. But every night, one of my last thoughts is, God, thank you for a day that I got to serve you. And if I wake up tomorrow, I'll serve you again. And I say that because I want him to take me in my sleep. I want him to take me without pain. I want him to do it on my terms. That's my selfishness. I pray that he would return before I have to watch my girls go through any heartbreak that they don't have to go through. And those are not bad things, but there's a fear associated with that because I don't want to die in a very bad way. I don't want to, because that bothers me. Um, but I think we can let that override our life. But if we just trust that the Bible says what it says and it's true, I can't add a day by worrying. And I'm also not going to trick God. He's not going to be like, oops, I'm sorry. I looked at somebody else's day count. You get to go back today. That's not how it works. I believe since before I was born, he knew when I was going home. And I trust in that fact. Yeah, yeah, what we put on our tombstones, we have nothing to do with. Since the foundations of the earth, your birth date was set in his mind, and your death was already written too. The schemes of the devil. That's the schemes of the devil. It's just the schemes of the devil. And, and, it, and it is. I mean, we see those things, but that, that's right there with looking for signs and things. And, and we're called not to do that. The only thing we need is this. We live by this. Jesus said, I do not live by what the earth provides. I live by this alone, by the word of God and everything that comes from it. So we can't look for signs. Okay, Chris, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, let's see. That may, that may, am I missing anybody's question? I think that may be it. And nobody asks a spiritual gift question. Praise Jesus. <laughs> you have one? Well, did you text it? Okay, well, what is your question? There's not a scripture that they stand on at all. So if you look through the Bible, there's no place where people get their hands laid upon and they go into a trance, have some type of activity in their body. Um, there's none of that. Now, the laying on of hands is in the Bible, but nothing that happens to that regard. In fact, the only two places, the only place that we find even something close to being slain in the spirit is literally when Ananias and Sapphira lie about their property and the Holy Spirit kills them in the moment and they fall, they fall forward instead of backwards and they're dead. So whenever I was going to Assembly of God school as a young kid and they would say, hey, we need to pray over you because you have never been slain in the spirit and you need to receive the Holy Spirit. I was like, I don't want that spirit because the only thing I have in the Bible is that people die. And at that point, I was a little kid. I mean, I was like seventh grade. I was like, I don't want that. Um, and that's why we have to be so careful. Like even this next, this next sermon, I'm having to talk about like in 14, like Paul's saying, like, listen, you want these tongues, but now the tongues have gone from being a known language to where you are talking like a barbarian. Now I'm going to tell you part of the sermon, the, the word barbarian that they use right there is not really a word. It's him saying you talk like you're just going bar, 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 and it's just this nonsense. It's kind of like whenever we write on something, blah, 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 blah. It's the same thing. That's what Paul's saying. He's going, when you do this, you're doing that. It edifies nobody. And you're talking to not God. You're talking to a God. 
you're, you're not even dealing with our God at that point. So there's all these things that if we're not careful, everybody twists everything. But the twisting always comes from one major issue. Our spiritual gifts are not made to glorify us. They're made to edify the church. That's why you have been given spiritual gifts. It's not for you to go do special things for God outside of the church. They're actually to edify the body of Christ, to teach, to be an evangelist for the body of Christ, all these things. So it edifies. So in the moment that all of a sudden because, well, I have the gift of prophecy. Well, one, you don't understand prophecy because what you think is prophecy is not what the Bible says is prophecy. It, prophecy is literally preaching with boldness. 98% of prophecy in the Bible is proclamation of the truth that's already there. 2% is future. Those are very few and far between. And so whenever we think of those things, well, as soon as Scripture twists to where it brings me glory, I've twisted the Scripture, or I don't have Scripture, I'm twisting what the focus is supposed to be. The focus is never me. The focus is always Christ. And how do I edify and build up others? That's it. So if it's like, hey, I go to a church because, like I, I told you all this, we had a lady show up one time, and she came up forward and said, hey, you need to leave this church because God has given you a great ministry. And I was like, I'm not leaving this church because this is the great ministry that God has allowed me to be a part of. And uh, she said, no, you're supposed to be a healer. And you need to go and do that because God's going to use you to heal people everywhere, and you're going you're gonna to be the guy that heals. I immediately knew in that moment that that was not from God because Jesus heals. And at any moment, I could be praying for somebody just like you could be praying for somebody. And if God desires to lay the gift of healing on me in that moment and they're healed, praise God, I receive the gift of healing for that moment. That does not mean I'm a healer and I get to start saying, hey, come see West High Note Ministries and he's going to heal people. That's not edifying the body at all. It's not edifying Christ. It's scam. And so we have to be very careful with those things. Okay, so there's no verse that any of that is in. In the, in the scripture. And if anybody says you have to speak in tongues to show that you're saved, uh, we have no record of Jesus. We have no record of John. We have no record of Peter. We have no record of Timothy. We have no record of Titus. We have no record of any of them speaking in tongues. And Paul says, I've been given the gift of tongues, but he says languages, which meant a known language. He was preaching, couldn't communicate, and for some reason God gave him the ability to speak in a foreign language that he had never heard before but he could do it. That's the gift of tongues. And when he says, if I speak in tongues of men and angels, it has nothing to do with an angelic language. He's saying, even if I could speak in those things, if I'm not loving people, it doesn't matter if I could even interpret angels speaking. He's not saying there's an angelic language you can get. He's saying, this is, this is the point. If you don't love, it doesn't matter what you say, even if it was angelic language. And he would probably say, I don't know any of that. Because his point was not that you speak in angelic language. It was that it doesn't matter what language I speak in. If it's not of love, with love, I don't have anything. So uh, we have to be very careful with those things. Chris, got like five minutes, bro. <laughs>